1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Or you can, if you hadn't already started, okay, good. <clears throat> In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe their chaste and respectful behavior. And let not your adornment be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the perishable, imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now, that was all for the wives. Now, the husbands don't get off. Stay with me now. Verse 7. You husbands, likewise, likewise, in the same way, likewise, live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Would you bow your head, please? Let's pray together. Father, we're just grateful to you for the wonderful experience that we've already had of being together as the family of love and worshiping the one who has brought us together and the one that we love and, and worship and adore. We just love you, Father. We thank you so much for saving us. And we thank you for the truth that's already been shared in song and in sermon today. And Father, we just pray now that you'll help us to focus on this very important matter. And Lord, I pray that we'll go away with a whole different attitude toward our marriage, about our home, than we came here with tonight. And we'll give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. We've been going through this book and thinking about the Christian life. And uh, tonight we're thinking about living in the home. Living in the home. The Christian faith is sometimes called the old-time religion. But, folks, I want you to know something. It's not just the old-time religion. It's the new-time religion. And it's the every-time religion. And it's the all-time religion. And it's just as valid today as it was in its infancy. Now, what we have just read would set most of modern women and even men too, on a tear. They just would say this is antiquated thinking, that this is absolutely not right for the 20th century, let alone the 21st century that is soon approaching, that this is antiquated thinking at its very worst, and that uh, wives, women are not to be submissive to men, that men and women are equal in every regard. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You, you get this all the time. And I tell you what, this modern women's movement has accomplished very, very little good and has created much, much harm in our homes and in our country. And so we can't right all their wrongs tonight, and we're not going to try to. We're just going to look at the Word of God, and I want to declare to you that what the Word of God said uh, these uh, hundreds of years ago when the Apostle Peter and uh, his helper there, Silvanus, being moved by the Spirit of God, put this down on paper. It's just as valid today as it was when they wrote it down. And i tell you what, if more homes, more marriages would get back to this, we would have a real turnaround in this nation. Now, you know, we have more sex education now. We have more uh, education in the area of of family and home and, and uh, about society than we've ever had before, and we've got more problems in the home now than we've ever had before. We've had, got sex education in our schools, and we've got more teen pregnancies. We've got venereal disease. It's an epidemic in our nation. There's one, this age ep AIDS epidemic that some are declaring are going to just wipe us plumb out. They say that by the year 2000, 
uh, just over the year 2000, if a woman wants to have a baby, she won't be able to get a bed in a hospital because the beds in the hospital would be all filled with AIDS patients. Now, I've heard that kind of scare talk, and I don't know if it's all true or not, but I know that we've got a serious problem with it. And it's not the only one. It's just the one that gets most of the headlines. It's not the only disease that's going around our nation. And, folk, listen, it's time that... Uh, that, uh, that the people begin to get back to God and to turn to God's ways. Now, now you say, well, what the, fu- what the family needs now, here we are in an era and a time when half the marriages end in divorce. What people need is to get back to God. But I want to tell you something, even Christian homes are failing. Because even those that know God, even those that know God and know the Lord as their Savior are not going by the Lord's rules. And so it's not just a matter of getting to God. It's a matter of getting to God and getting to God as Lord and doing it His way. And so this is a very serious matter that we're, we're thinking about tonight. And uh, so let's just uh, look at this and, and, and see what it is that the Lord would say to you and to me tonight about our individual homes. First of all, I want you to notice He speaks to the wife about obligation. That's an ugly word nowadays. Words like obligation and commitment and duty. Those are all ugly. People don't like to hear those words today. But those are the words that save households. Those are the words that save families. Those are the the things that that are missing today in the character of the people that are entering into marriages. And that's why they're crumbling all around us. You see, people enter into marriages now with the idea of what can this person do for me. They marry, a woman marries a man, and a man marries a woman uh, with that in mind. How is this going to fulfill me as a person? And that's totally against the way God has set the whole thing up. And just what we've read already, if we didn't even comment on what we've read, if you could just take that home and start practicing that, you'd see. What a real difference it would make if everybody else would do that too. He says to the woman, in a way of obligation, he says that, that you are to be submissive to your husband. Now, subordination doesn't mean that the wife is inferior to the husband. It doesn't mean that at all. As a matter of fact, in some areas, women are much superior to men. Men and women are not in competition. They are meant to complement each other. Now, the modern way of thinking is that the man and the woman are in competition. That is not right. That's not the way God created things. And just to be in a position of, of submission is not to be in a place of inferiority. Because, you see, God is a God of order. And God has structured things in this world in such a way that there is a chain of command, if you're familiar with that kind of word. There's a, an organization to the way God has set everything up. And in the home, God has set it up to where the husband and the father is the one that he's looking to for the welfare, the well-being, and the religious instruction of that home. Now, to be sure, most men have abdicated that responsibility totally. Ab- absolutely abdicated it. But the structure that God has set up is for the wife to be in a place of submission to her husband because God has set it up in a manner where the husband is the one that he's looking to and the one that he is holding responsible. You see, this is that same military word that we talked about back over in chapter 2 where it says that that uh, we are to be submissive to the government and we are to, and slaves or employees are to be submissive to their masters or to their employers. It's a military term that, that puts you in a, in a structure so that even though, uh, you know, a, a, a private may join the army and have a higher IQ than the sergeant, he's still supposed to do what the sergeant says. And that's the way it used to be. I don't know if they still do that or not. That's the way it used to be, I guarantee you. And so it doesn't mean that a woman is is inferior in any regard. It simply means that's the way she fits in God's table of organization. Women are to be submissive to their husbands. A lot of people, a lot of women uh, marry their husbands and they really don't know very much about them when they get married. They don't know what kind of leader they're going to be. And I think the young ladies in our church that I've talked to that are are looking for a, a husband, a life partner, 
they're looking for a man that will be that spiritual leader in their home. And I congratulate them, and I would just say and encourage them, wait until you find that person, because I believe God has that person for each and every one of you. But a lot of women marry men, they just don't even really know that. Well, I heard about one woman that married a fellow, and they started having trouble, and, and she went to see her pastor, and the pastor said, well, how long did you know him before you got married? And she said, I knew him about, eight, uh, uh, we were acquainted, I met him 18 months ago, but I didn't really know him until I asked him for some money. <laughs> You think you know somebody until you start living with them, amen? And so you just can't, you can't, uh, you can't spend enough time getting acquainted with each other. You really can't. I must, I, I plugged over here and I got one. I think I snagged one over here. <laughs> that same man, he said, well, my wife's always bugging me for money. And his friend said, well, what does she do with it when you give it to her? He said, I don't know. I never gave her any before. <laughs> But the Lord speaks a word of obligation to the woman. He says to the woman, you be in a subordinate position, a submissive position to your husband because he is the one that I'm holding responsible for your home, for your home. And a lot of times, let's be frank with you, a lot of times God can't get to that man because the wife keeps jumping out in front of him. Can you hear me? God wants to work with that man. So, first of all, we need to think about obligation. And then he gives object lessons here for us. That, that very first way that this chapter starts off, it says, in the same way. In the same way. Now, what does he mean by in the same way? Now, some commentators believe that he, he's going back to that place where he talks about being submitted to the government, about where he's talking about slaves being submitted to their masters. But I want to tell you where I think he's going back to, and I think he's going back to over here where it talks about Jesus, where it talks about the Lord and how that he is our example, in verse 21, an example for you to follow in his steps. Just as the Lord Jesus was submitted to the Father, willfully submitted to the Father, willingly submitted to the Father, that's the way the Lord wants wives to be submitted to their husbands, like Jesus, in the same way. And he gives that object lesson. And, and then not only does he give an object lesson there, but also he shows by example the illustration of individuals further on down here. He refers to Sarah and those holy women of former times. So he gives them object lessons and, and ex examples here of of how wives are to be submitted to husbands and, and how they're to see Christ as their pattern as Christ was subject to the Father. You know, the trouble is that most people today are not getting their guides from the holy people of the Word and they're not getting their guide from the Lord Jesus. They're getting their guides off the television and off the movie screen. It's just like uh, one of the men that I was reading about this passage said he was in a, a grocery line and he overheard two women and they were talking about a marriage breaking up and he was getting interested. You know, he, he couldn't help but hear them. <clears throat> you know, and, and so they were talking about this marriage breaking up and he was getting all concerned. And come to find out they were talking about some something on the soap operas. Amen? <laughs> One of the ladies uh, at the uh, at the meetings this week, a, a dear, dear uh, lady, uh, I never did know her name. Everybody just calls her Granny, and she she used to sell Sarah Coventry, and she says she was selling that Sarah Coventry, and women would be saying, "Hurry and write this order. I got to get home. It's nearly 1:30," and she didn't know what they were talking about. I had to get home and watch a soap opera. And folks, that's not just. I'm not just talking about people on the streets out there. I'm not just talking about people that don't know the Lord. But a lot of Christian people do not have the Lord as their idol, take that in the right way, nor do they have holy people as their idols. They have as their idols the people of this world. The ungodly people of this world are the idols of many of our young people. And I want just to encourage the young people here tonight. I want to encourage us all. Set your life, set your, set your heart on being patterned after the Lord and over, on the people of the Word, godly people. You want to follow somebody's 
footsteps, follow somebody that's going somewhere. But a lot of people, they are just being, being guided by what, uh, what is being said and done on television and in the movies. So he gives them this object lesson, and there's an objective in mind that he has here. And he's speaking really primarily to those women who are in that very, very tough position that too many women are in, and that is being married to an unbeliever. Being married to an unbeliever. And, and I, I, that just seems to be a dominant thing that I've noticed in, in church. Women married to men that don't know God, don't love God, and give them a hard, hard time about trying to follow the Lord. And this is primarily who he's speaking to here. And he tells them here that the key to it, that the, the objective of trying to win that husband to the Lord can be reached better by the way you live than by what you say. No one was ever nagged into heaven. No one was ever nagged into the, into, the, into the Christian life. Nobody was. And so he's encouraging them to, to live such a life of submission and, and of godliness and showing forth the character of a godly woman in that home that that man will be attracted not by the way she looks and adorns herself, not by the the, the uh, glamorous way that she might adorn herself, but by the godly way she lives. Now, I'm not going to say to anybody that's easy. That's the hardest thing. And every woman that I know that's in a situation like that, I admire them. I know. I sympathize with them. I know they're having a hard time. I know what a hard time it is. And we need to pray for the ladies and our church that are in that kind of situation and, and try to do everything we can to encourage them. Because that's a hard, hard place to be. But he says this is the way it's to be done. This is the way you're to do it. And my, my general approach anytime I'm speaking to someone in a situation like that where there's a, a discord in the home over this matter, uh, uh, my general advice is you, until that man starts be beating on them, they ought to stay. They ought to stay until that man starts whipping on them. Now, when he starts whipping on them, that's the time to leave. I don't think God expects you to stick around for that. He said be, a, be submissive. He didn't say be a doormat or a punching bag. But uh, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's so many cases down through history. St. Augustine's mother, Monica. St. Augustine's father was a godless man, a godless man, a pagan. But Monica the mother of the man we call St. Augustine, lived just like this before that man. And before he finally left this life, he himself became a Christian. There's a, a, one of the kings of France, Clovis of France. His wife was a Christian. He was not. But she lived this kind of godly life around him. And Clovis, the king of France, became a Christian because of his wife's godly example. It can be done. And praise God, I, I'm not going to name any names now, but some of you know who I'm talking about when I say this. We're seeing that happen in one of the families in our home, in our church right now. We're seeing it slowly, slowly come to pass. It hasn't happened yet, but we know that it's going to happen. We've got a lot of people praying, and we've got a, a, a wife and mother that's standing in there and hanging in there and trying to be that godly wife in that home and praying for her husband, and loving her husband. You see, it's an easy thing to see through a man. But the hard part is seeing the man through. Amen? That's the hard part. But you can do it with the Lord. You can do it with the Lord. You can absolutely do it. Now, there's a warning involved in that, too, for you, you young ladies that haven't gotten married. Don't marry an unbeliever. Don't do it. Don't marry somebody that's, that, that doesn't know Christ and is not, not uh, as a matter of fact, I'd go further than that and say not only just a Christian and a church member, but a dedicated Christian. It'll be that spiritual head of the home that you hope to have one day. <laughs> and then if you find yourself, these ladies that find themselves in that situation, be a godly wife. Be submissive to, her, to your husband. There's one woman that had a, an unbeliever as a husband, and she got down, and she just felt like God was going to call her to the mission field <laughs> and out of that house, I guess. 
And she got out and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. The guy would call her the mission field. And she got up finally. She said, well, I don't know what Jesus wants, but I know what John, my husband, wants, and I'll just serve him. And she won her husband by living a godly life before him, like it says right here. Folk, uh, I know it can get dark in a situation like that. I just know it can get dark in a thing. But there's not enough darkness in the world to put out the light of just one little candle. Wives, be submissive. He gives a, an obligation and an object lesson and then a, the objective to win their wives. And then unto husbands, he's got a word of <laughs> wisdom here too. So hang on, guys. Here's what he says in verse 7 to the men. He says, men, likewise, live with your wives. Now, in, in this seventh verse, live with your wives in an understanding way as the weaker vessel since she is a woman and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Three things he's saying here. First of all, he's saying in this matter of living with your wives, there's more involved there than just sharing the same, the same roof, the same house. What, he's literally, what, what literally is being said here is that the husband's to provide for his family. The husband's to provide for his wife and his children. The husband is the key provider. He's the breadwinner. He's the one that's, that's really the one responsible for keeping that shelter over their heads and the food on the table. And sometimes through the way that our society has gotten now where things are so much expen more expensive than they ought to be, etc., etc., you find wives that have to work outside the home. But God looks at that man as a principal provider. For the home. Now, sometimes it can't be that way because of injuries or, or sickness or, or poor health in some way. But generally speaking, he's saying, men, you're the ones that are supposed to bring home the bacon. It's the man's responsibility to be the breadwinner in the home. And I'm going to just, I'll interject even this to you. Now, this ain't, ain't going to sit good with a lot of you guys, but I'll tell you what, I think the man ought to pay the bills. <laughs> I didn't get a single amen out of that. <laughs> I really do. I think, it's the man, I think the man ought to have that responsibility on his shoulders. That's right. He ought not make his wife sweat through that. He ought not make his wife worry about where those bills are going to be paid or not. I think the man ought to be the one that takes care of that checkbook. Now, the wife carries it around all the time, but every couple of weeks on payday, he's ought to get that thing out and then pay all the bills. Wife isn't supposed to have that kind of weight on her. Amen. No, amen. <laughs> well, that was me talking, I think, a little bit more than Lord. But I, I think there's a prince. I, I could probably find scripture on that somewhere if I just <laughs> worked hard at it. Yeah, yeah. It's not supposed to fall on her. You're, you, you're, you're supposed to protect her. You're supposed to be her protector and her provider. Don't make her worry about whether something's going to get paid or not. Oh, no. Not only is a man to be uh, to look after her physically, but he says thoughtfully. He says in an understanding way. In an understanding way. Now, I, I really got under some heavy-duty conviction thinking about all these things, to be frank with you. Uh, <laughs> Warren Wiersbe, when he does marriage counseling, he sets the... I said we were going to be brief. Uh, he sets, he sets the, 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 the gal and the guy down, and he gives them a sheet of paper, and he says, all right, just take about five minutes and write down th the three things. The guy is to write down the three things that the girl likes to do best, and the girl is to write down the three things that the guy likes to do best. And he said, invariably, the girl can sit there and write all three of them just like that. And the guy's sitting there going, <laughs> what does she like to do best? Now, you know, the guy's, that, that kind of indicted me, you know. How about you? I mean, even after years of marriage, there's probably a lot of husbands here tonight, or somewhere tonight. I better cut this short, hadn't I? <laughs> that still couldn't fill out that piece of paper. What does your wife really like to do? What does she really, can, you, can you think of the three things that your wife really likes to do? Deal with your wife in an understanding way. Have, be thoughtful of your wife is what he's saying. Be thoughtful to, uh, toward her and toward her needs and, 
and, and what her likes and dislikes are and, and what, uh, what uh, fears brings fear on her. This is serious stuff, isn't it? And then also he said here that we're to, to deal with them honorably. He said to see them in an honorable way as a fellow heir of the grace of God. As a fellow heir of the grace of God. I uh, came home yesterday from the office and I'd been down there studying. I told Glenn, I said, you know, I was working on this message in 1 Peter 3 and I got to thinking about my grandfather. And uh, all my grandparents divorced and all of them but one was married again when I came into the world. And, and uh, the grandfather that I'm thinking about was my mother's father. We called him Big Dad. You know how you get those little family names for people? So you, we had Big Dad and Big Mama and Mom and, you know, all, you know, you got those things too. Well, Big Dad, uh, when, he, when he left this life, he didn't leave very much behind. He didn't leave very much property, a little frame house and furniture and stuff like that. But he left me something real important. And that was this, that when, when his wife was diagnosed with brain cancer, and as she began to go through that deterioration, and little by little began to, to lose her skills and lose her memory, and, and even got to the place where she just didn't know anybody, didn't know him, didn't know anybody, and even down to the place where where she would just lie in bed and just, you know, look off. He finally died. He left me the most important thing. He left me an example of somebody walking in true devotion. You see, uh, Hollywood has never come up with the perfect love story. But I've seen it. I've seen the love story. I've seen a real love story. It's a cruel story. Hard. Matter of fact, I don't know if I told you about this once before or not. One time he was visiting her in the hospital and he went back home. And as he was going back to where he parked his car, two men jumped him and made him go and check his money out of his savings account and give him his money. Give him his money. She never knew about it. Kept it a total secret. He never, she never knew, never had any inkling from his countenance that anything had ever happened. And he stayed with her right on through to the very end. And the way he died was driving out to the cemetery one morning. Early in the morning, the sun was coming up. And he lost his vision in the sunlight, ran into a parked car on his way to the cemetery. That's a love story, folks. That is a love story. You know, if all of us husbands could really love our wives that way. I don't think we'd have a lot of trouble with submission in the home. A man told his pastor, said, Pastor, I love my wife so much. He said, I love her too much. He said, I, I just afraid I just love her too much. The pastor said, when you get to the point you love your wife more than Christ loved the church, you come back and we'll talk about it. That's how a man's to love his wife, like Christ loved the church. And what? gave himself. You know what? A happy home is homemade. <laughs> a happy home is homemade. You'll never learn how to make a happy home watching the soap opera, going to the movies. You'll never learn it. There's only one way to learn about how to have a happy home. That's to read this book. Pray. 
Love each other with a godly love and do it God's way. That's the only way it'll work. That's what a happy home. Somebody said that, that a happy home is kind of like goulash. Nobody knows what goes in it except them what makes it. But it's not that mysterious. It's all right here. It's all right here. Let's stand.